great great to see all my students <laughs> yes ma'am i'm fine ma'am uh, malsam are you from the 2001 batch which batch are you all are you arun bhai they are after us ma'am they are juniors i you are which batch harish 2000 2002 ma'am you know one boy santosh who ma'am santosh santosh malu malu or something he was teaching in ravancha university i think from the 2000 yeah i am from 2001 batch no ma'am uh, ma are uh, is one year senior than me is 2001 to 3 batch that suresh singh batch Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Who, ma'am? Santosh. Santosh Malu, Malu, or something. He was teaching in Ravancha University. Yeah, Santosh Malviya, ma'am. Santosh Malviya. Yeah, I am from Kolkata. He passed away, you know, due to COVID. No, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I came to know. I met him at uh, Kannur Indian History Congress in two thousand nineteen. They are organizing a memorial lecture, so I am going there on twenty sixth. You know. Really Where, ma'am, at Ravancha University? Ah, uh ah, -huh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. How is it hot in Allahabad? Very hot. Ma'am, for last two three days it is okay, but otherwise it was forty seven or forty six. Very hot <laughs> till last week. <laughs> okay, hello. <laughs> mm. Hello, Malsum. Yes, Malsom is very busy with the technical things. Just wait. Yes. Okay. Anyhow, uh, shall we start then? Fine. A very very warm evening to each and every one of you, and this is the day that we have been waiting for a long time. So, uh, let me say that I remember it was last year when I asked, uh, ma'am. To have a lecture on bhakti and Sufism, because uh, this topic was included in MPSC MPSC syllabus. Okay, I thought that it would be good for the aspirant, and I know she was very busy in her academic life and also being a mother, she was quite busy. I know that, but to my surprise, she said that why not? And then again, this semester we have uh, a course on bhakti and <laughs> so uh, I and Wali together to talk about it, and she was also of the opinion that we should be having this kind of. And then finally, uh, uh, is that okay? ああ、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、
every of our tiny bit of our queries and also our complaint. And then uh, her academic wisdom and her advice, it had started out a roadmap for our academic future, uh, which was even instrumental even in today. Uh, now, uh, I shall give a time uh, to any of the faculty who are present tonight, if uh, they like to speak a few words, uh, I would give them a time. Any professor, Zwali? So it, it, it's okay, like I'll be giving them time again at the end. Uh, so let me introduce the speaker again, as you can see from the poster itself. Uh, Ma'am is Professor Rekapande, he is currently the director of SEED. Uh, Professor of Emerita and the scholar who excel especially in the field of gender studies. Uh, to her credit, she had a tar of book, which you can Google yourself because it's she had a tower of book. And then she was invited uh, to be a speaker across the globe. Uh, in short, let me just say that she is a never ceasing academician who dares to go beyond the uncertain mountain. Now I had, will be giving a time to professor and, and after she had given a lecture, you can ask a question either in a chat box or directly you can address it to her. So now the time is yours, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Malsam. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Uh, once again, you know, um, he's spoken so highly about me. If I don't come up to the expectation, don't blame me, blame him. I think it is a love of a student that is speaking. And I'm very happy to be part of this group. And uh, especially, I know all my students know Zwali, Malsam and all. They are uh, that, uh, you know, I'm very close to them in Mizoram. I keep telling others, you know, the kind of food that the kind of warmth and hospitality which we enjoy when we come here. And Malsam, I hope I don't like these online lectures, you know, <laughs> maybe face to face, you can see immediately. So next lecture, I'm only going to give you when you'll have me face to face, okay? <laughs> so, you know, I'm really happy to be here and they have asked me to speak on um, this uh, movement, you know, uh, the bhakti movement and uh, um, this is a topic you know which is a part of your ma syllabus and it will also be you know it is uh, in the ias exam i understand there are lots of students in the ias exam so we often ask you know many short questions in fact jrf and all it is always easy to formulate questions on this topic and uh, you will always have one or two questions related to this. You know, this was a very important movement which took place in medieval India. But unfortunately, you know, because earlier our history writing was only focusing on, uh, uh, you know, political history. So we did not really give attention to it. And then when we started talking about social history, economic history, then too, you know, we really did not pay attention to this because most of it was left to either the department of philosophy that analyzed it or the literature department in the literature or the regional literature. Very few historians worked on this topic because one, you know, when we talk of history, the sources are very important. And here is a movement from the lower sections of society. Many of them were not literate. They were not writing in Sanskrit. They were writing in regional languages. And so, you know, it never became a part of the mainstream history and therefore you know I would really like to talk about this uh, movement and give you some information I will try to quickly finish what I have to say and then we can have a discussion according to Hindu philosophy there are three ways in which you can reach God one is Gyan that is knowledge You know, this was the philosophy of Shankaracharya and this was the uh, philosophy of uh, Bhagavad Gita. And the third was bhakti or devotion. So primarily, you know, this movement comes about from this third stream. And the word bhakti, it means to utter. 
you know, to have devotion. It also means love. And, uh, you know, when you look at all the literature, it talks a lot about love, honor. And you have a lot of terms in Hindi. You know, uh, bhakti can be something for your motherland. You can love your motherland. You can love your mother. You can love your father. So you have terms like desh bhakti, pitra bhakti, matra bhakti. And so, you know, this is a very popular concept. But though this movement comes in medieval period, it emerges right from ancient period. You know, if you look at some of the text of Hinduism, if you read Rig Veda, the Brihad Arnekya Upanishad, the Chandogya Upanishad, Katha Upanishad, Kaushika Upanishad, you come across this term many times. And it is the Bhagavad Gita, which is a very important text of the Hindus where this term is explained. And it says that, you know, uh, you have to worship me. It talks about a God. It talks about a God that is very loving, that is very graceful. And if you love this God with any kind of, you know, without uh, selflessly, then, you know, you can uh, surrender to that God and you become one with that God. You know, so this philosophy is something which is found in the Bhagavad Gita. And throughout history, you know, we've had lots of movements right from ancient period. And this, you know, slowly they pick up this concept from ancient India and it becomes prevalent in medieval India. And, uh, you know, there was a large number of reasons why it uh, became a movement in uh, uh, medieval India. I'll be talking about the, you know, context, the material context of this movement. If you look at the society, you look at the economy, you look at the polity of this time, there were lots of developments which were taking place. And this movement really started in South of India. It emerges around seventh century. And uh, it was basically, uh, it had two fold aims in South India. One, you know, Jainism and Buddhism had become very popular in South. So they were trying to remove this influence and second, you know, the Brahmin, which was the topmost uh, class, they had established their monopoly in religion. You know, they were the ones who would perform all the rituals, all the texts were written in Sanskrit, which was the monopoly of the Brahmins. Others were not allowed to read and write it. So, you know, this movement started in South India, basically to, you know, eradicate the influence of Buddhism and Jainism and fight against the monopoly of the uh, Brahmins. And what they did is they used the regional language. They said, we don't want to read and write in Sanskrit. They didn't know it also. They said, we will use a regional language and then try to worship God in our regional language. Now, this concept of bhakti brought it very close to the masses because, you know, you had, whether you look at it in Gujarat, people were writing in Gujarati, in Odisha, they were writing in Odia, in, uh, you know, UP, they were writing in Avadi, and uh, in South, they were writing either in Tamil, Kannadiga, Telugu. So, you know, they Punjabi. So all kinds of regional languages become very important. The first saints were the Alvars. They were the ones, you know, who started by worshipping Vishnu. And they wrote lovely songs about Krishna. And they were talking about the love of Krishna. Right from 5th century to 10th century, you find... The 10 Alvars who were prominent, they were the ones, you know, though they were total 12 Alvars, there was a woman also among them, Andal. And uh, you have, uh, you know, they were composing songs and they were writing songs about uh, God. Then you had the Nainars, they were Shaiva Bhaktas. You know, you have two major uh, religious streams in Hinduism. One is Krishna Bhakti and the other is Shiv Bhakti. And there were 63 saints in this, the Nainars, who were uh, worshipping Shiva. Uh, Nambi under uh, Nambi became very important. They wrote Thevaram, they composed uh, music in their own uh, languages. Now, some of the important features of this movement was, they said that you don't have to know Sanskrit or you don't have to read the religious text in order to reach salvation. You can only love God, you can show devotion and you can get salvation. And they said, you know, God is only one. You may know him by different name, but there is only one God. And he has a true name. You have to surrender to that God. 
they did not believe in any kinds of ritual ceremonies or blind faith. Many of them were against idol worship, some were for idol worship, and they were, you know, uh, they did not believe in different kinds of caste. They felt there is a universal brotherhood of mankind. All of us are same. But they emphasized a lot on guru. A teacher was something which was very important. There is a very famous poem by Kabir, you know, which he says that in front of me are standing both God and my guru. Guru is the teacher. He says, whose feet should I touch first? I don't know. I'm confused. But, and then he answers himself and he says, I will touch the feet of my guru first, the feet of my teacher first, because it is through the teacher that I came to know God. So, you know, they give much more importance to the teacher, even, you know, giving um, a teacher the more importance than even uh, God, because it is the teacher who guides you. And many of them travel from one place to another. See, this is the map of India in medieval times. And you can see this movement throughout India. You And you can see some of the saints. You have Dadu Deyal, and then you have Guru Nanak in Punjab, Chaitanya, Surdas, Ekna, Tukaram, Basavanna, Ramdas, Purandardas, all of them. You know, throughout India, you have these saints who are writing and uh, you know, um, singing songs. If you look at this movement in North India, it develops along two forms. You know, one is called Sagun Bhakti, where they believed in the worship of uh, an idol. You know, the worship idol could be the idol of Krishna, it could be of Ram. And the other is a Nirgun uh, form of Bhakti, where God does not have any shape. You, you know, there is a very famous poem by Surdas. And he says, you are asking me to describe my God. But he says, if you give jaggery to a man who is dumb, how will he explain to you how he's feeling? You can see the expression in his eyes. So God is similarly like that. You know, you can feel God through your eyes. You don't have to explain to him. And some of the important saints where, you know, you have people like Kabir, Nanak, Surdas, Mirabai, they were in North India. If you look at it in South, I've already told you that there were Alberts and Nayanards from 7th to 8th century, they were there. Then you have something called the period of the Acharyas. The Acharyas, what they did, they brought in the Bhakti tradition and they also brought in the knowledge together. They said both have to be combined together. You had people like Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, Anamacharya, Purandardas, who became important. In Andhra, you had three people like Malikarjun Pandita, Somnath, Sripati Pandita, who were the main scholars. And in Karnataka, you had Basavanna, who formed the Veer Shaiva movement. And you also had a woman called Akka Mahadevi. You know, so you have all these uh, people who propagated. If you look at it in East India, you know, the Vaishnava tradition becomes very important here. You have Chaitanya, who started the Garud Gaudiya school of Vaishnavism. And what they did, they spoke of, uh, you know, the dualistic nature of uh, knowledge. They gave a lot of importance to Krishna. They believed in brotherhood equality. If you look at it in Assam, you have Shankar Dev, who becomes very important. You know, he's, the, he's a non-Brahmin. He does not belong to the Brahmin uh, community. And he is um, one of the Buyan chiefs. And he started the neo Vaishnavite movement. They were also, you know, uh, questioning the age old restriction of caste, superstition, ignorance, and poverty. If you look at it in Western India, you have, you know, it develops in 15th century along Krishna Bhakti of Narsing Mehta. And then you have Swami Narayan temples of the Shahajian Swami. If you see it in Maharashtra, right from 13th to 17th century, there are five important sects that emerge. They are known as Sampradaya. But the most important among them were Mahanubhav and Varkari tradition. So, you know, what is very interesting is this is a movement which is spread throughout India. And the main reason why Bhakti arose at this time was we can see a number of changes that were occurring in medieval societies whether you look at it in the area of society, culture, political, 
area, you know, they were far reaching changes that were occurring. There was a, you know, agrarian expansion that had taken place and uh, there was large scale crop production. Many regional kingdoms had come into prominence. The Turks had come and established the kingdom. You know, Delhi Sultanate was very prominent at this time. And for the first time, the Turks devised the Ikta system. What happened through the Ikta system? You know, they never went, the noblemen, the king, they never went into rural areas. But all the peasants were organized in the rural areas. They took all the surplus and that reached the noblemen in the cities. So there is an expansion of the cities and urbanization which is taking place. And we find that a large number of, you know, regionalism becomes very prominent at that time. If you look at the period between 13th to 16th century, it is no longer the period of the large empires at this time. You no longer have the, you know, Harshavardhana or Chandragupta Maurya when they had huge empires. You had small provincial and regional state that had become important. By the time you come to 16th century, uh, India is divided into a number of regions, Bengal, Khandesh, Jaunpur, Malwa, Bihar, Sindh, and even in the south, you know, you have five kingdoms which emerge from the Bahamani kingdom, Golconda, Bijapur, Bidar, Berar, Ahmednagar. So economically, you know, this was a period where I've already explained towns were expanding and there was an increase in craft production. One can also see an increase in technology. You know, it is very interesting that in 11th century, when uh, a letter would come to the Delhi court, they would read that letter, then wash it and keep it for using second time. But by the time you come to 14th century, even the sweet seller who was selling sweets in the corner of the street, you know, he would fold his sweets in a paper and hand it over to his customer. So, you know, there is so much of an increase in paper which takes place at this time. And uh, there is a lot of, you know, changes in technology. You have uh, in sericulture, carpet weaving, vertical room, which comes, agriculture is expanding. There are huge um, lands which are given to you know, Brahmins, and there is an increase in technology which leads to expansion of um, towns and altering of uh, new relations. Now, as a result of this, what happens? There are new groups which emerge all over India. You know, you have new artisan, mercantilist uh, uh, group, and they had acquired a lot of wealth. But in the Indian hierarchy, the Vaishyas, as they are known, they never had a status. You had the Brahmins who were at top, then you have the Kshatriyas, then you have the Vaishyas. So, you know, it was almost that they wanted a system where they would have a high status. And uh, they did not want to go with that old kind of Hinduism in which they had no status. Another very important reason why this movement emerges is that temples become a very important center of bhakti at this time. You know, it is the temple around which the whole nucleus of the village, towns, and commerce flourished. And they were associated very closely with the territorial and communal bodies. You also have a large scale participation of people in these activities. You know, people are traveling from one place to another. There's a lot of pilgrimage which is happening. They are making so many offerings. Today also, you know, if you look at some of these old temples, Tirupati and others, you know, they get huge amount of money by what people offer. And the temple became a citadel of socioeconomic uh, activities. They became the whole, you know, after 10th century, it is the temple which becomes the, uh, you know, political, socio and economic uh, center. They had huge income at their disposal. <clears throat> they, they would spend this money and it also became the center of economic life. You know, every temple had huge lands attached to it. There were weavers who would weave clothes for the God. There were um, agricultural land where they would grow paddy and other kinds of things. Each temple had its own wells, ponds, etc. And they had their own goldsmith, blacksmith. 
you know, God is treated like a human being. And just as the king needed a whole paraphernalia to serve him, the temple God also needed all these things. So a large number of people got employment through the temple. And all this became possible because there was a lot of patronage given to the people. You know, they, uh, the kings also gave a lot of wealth. And we find that, you know, right from 10th century onwards, there is a huge increase in temple. They had lots of power and privileges. The Brahmins are appointed as Raj Purohits. They are asked on for advice on different uh, uh, matters. And it is these temples that were directing agricultural development. As I mentioned, they had huge grants. They were given a lot of grants. They had huge land employment endowments with them. And the person who gave them these endowments, he would specify how this money has to be used. You know, they would spend this money uh, in either um, uh, providing oil for the lamb, providing food, providing other kinds of uh, facilities. The temple also became a bank, you know, when the landlords and others needed money, when the king needed money to fight a war, he would borrow it from the temple. And therefore, you know, you had two kinds of endowment that were coming to the temple. One was through land, which they, you know, used to um, um, have agriculture. And the second one was directly through uh, money. And we find that, uh, you know, many a time um, they were, uh, they would also lend out this money. The temple was using this money very frequently. It invested in uh, business and they became very rich in the process. Temples also became a tool for urbanization because people were traveling from one place to another. There was a lot of commercial activities. With the first travel routes in India were across the temples because you know uh, people would go from one place to another. They would need a lot of things. And you have these whole urban centers which came up. If you look at some of the merchant guilds like Aviolu or Dakarumi in Andhra region, you know, all these came about because it was the temple that was supporting them. So in short, you know, the temple became very rich in medieval times. They had a lot of money at their disposal. They had huge lands at their disposal. They were, they were using these endowments to become, you know, invest more and more in money. It became, you know, where it was the whole nucleus around the village where, you know, the village existed, the commerce uh, uh, flourished. And we find that the temple was both the landlord as well as the employer. Now, you know, many of the saints who were writing, see, since I work mostly on women, I have looked at women primarily, but many of the bhaktas who were, you know, they did not like the old order. They were talking of a new order. They rejected ascetism. Uh, they wanted to talk of liberty and the whole, you know, dominant voice of these people in the bhakti movement was that uh, they were talking of, uh, uh, you know, universalism, rejection of institutionalized religion, and they were talking of more internal devotion. You need to uh, have devotion towards God, concept of love. They were talking of an egalitarian uh, attitude. But what was important was, by and large, they left out the women and Shudras also to some extent. And, you know, they never, though they were talking about changing the society, they were talking about bringing in, a, you know, an equal society where everybody is equal in the eyes of God, women were not part of it. They continued, you know, they could not rise about the age old prejudice where women were seen as an impediment to salvation. If you look at Hindu philosophy, it says that when you are, you know, this is something which is there in Christianity also, you know, the earlier church fathers, they were, you know, you could either look upon a woman as a goddess or she was a whore. You could not narrate to, you know, normal women. In fact, if one of the church fathers, you know, he writes, he says, I wish God had found some other way of procreation without women being involved in it. So, you know, they, were, they had a very ambivalent attitude towards women. This is true of many religion and the same is applied for Hinduism also. And they could not really rise up about this, that if you have possession, which is known as Kanak, you know, Kanak is gold, having possession. 
and second um, is kamini women these are impediments to salvation you know if you look at the franciscan orders and others also the first you know they embrace poverty they said unless you embrace poverty you cannot reach god so therefore you know many of these saints had this kind of an attitude now this is but natural because they were living in a patriarchal society where they looked upon women as maya she was an impediment to the path of bhakti and they visualized women only in those roles in the family you know a woman had to be in the family she had to serve her husband she had no worth outside the institution of marriage and through this institution she has to serve her husband so you know though they were talking of a change all that change in society which they wanted women were not part of it it was only for themselves that they were talking and what was very interesting is you again had a large number of women who became part of this movement and they were you know they were so dynamic they were so revolutionary that they completely you know they charted their own uh, uh, course and they sowed the seed that a women can herself be a part of uh, her own emancipation we have to understand a little you know early women have no space if you look at it historically the only space women had was in religion in the ancient period you know buddha initially he did not want women to become part of his order but slowly when he encouraged women and he allowed women to uh, come become part of this then um, you know the women had to leave their household they had to join the sangha they could never marry they had to be spinsters this was something which is there for many nuns also and so you know if you wanted to reach god you had to adopt this life but here was a movement which was saying you don't have to leave life you can continue to be a householder you can continue to be married and yet you can reach god you can have love for god you can have devotion for god but this did not really translate to women and i will just give you examples of few women i'll read out from their poems to give you a flavor of what they were writing the most important among them is akka mahadevi she is in 12th century she was a great devotee of shiva and she is said to be so beautiful that the kaushiki who was the chieftain of the land he fell in love with her and he wanted to marry her he in fact he though her father was a very rich merchant in that um, village called udutal but he sent a proposal and uh, akka mahadevi you know uh, keeps a promise she says you will not touch me against my wishes and he agrees and she marries him but then you know when he touches her three times finally what she does she walks out of the house and according to legend you know she walks out naked see ultimately what is the sign of protest you know if you look at her figures you can see you have she is shown with a long hair which covers her private part because she never wore any clothes and imagine this is 12th century uh, you have these women lal dev is another women in kashmir see akama devi is in karnataka lal dev is in kashmir and in 14th century there is you know i don't think they had any kind of communication at that time she is married when she is 12 years old into another brahmin family nika bhat at pempor and there are so many stories about her you know she is treated so badly by her family and her name is padmavati and finally she also gets fed up and she leaves her house and she also walks out naked you know imagine 14th century and if you look at lauded you know they say that um, her you know her stomach expands so much that it covers her private parts and she dances in frenzy and she gets you know totally immersed in a god meena bai is from 15th end of 15th century beginning of 16th century people know a lot more about meera than they know about other saints because she's acquired some kind of pan india you know this thing she she is um, she comes from uh, uh, Raj, rajasthan and she is married into the royal family of sashodhya now you know according to legend once you know there, uh, there is a wedding procession which is passing out of her window 
and she you know she keeps pestering her mother tell me who is going to, who is my groom you know they say that's the bride groom that is growing going and she says who is my groom please tell me who is my groom and uh, then her mother you know just to make her quiet she picks up a statue of krishna and says this is your groom and from that day meera considers herself wedded to krishna and finally you know when she is married she refuses to consummate her marriage she says i am already married to krishna obviously she belongs to the royal family they did not like her and finally she also leaves the palace first she starts staying in a small temple outside the palace and she starts wandering around and uh, going to places associated with krishna sehjo bai is in 15 1765 and we hear so many stories about her in sehjo prakash you know it is one of the um, major sects um, book of the text of the chandradasi um, sect and it shows that you know she is so busy working grinding corn sweeping digging and she also refers to guru you have other two women from um, gujarat deval bai and gora bai you know uh, the, they are brahmin child uh, widows they are from very poor family and they are left to um, um, in charge of guru bhagwan who teaches them bhakti then there is ganga sati is another uh, women from uh, gujarat and uh, she is a great uh, devotee and she is married to khaluba khaluba is again you know uh, from uh, saurashtra there is another very important saint called sant toral and uh, she is also you know married to um, sant satya who is a village chieftain and there is a dacoit in that region known as jessal and he had made three promises that he is going to acquire tati toral and uh, toli now you know these three were price, priceless thing you know tati was the very famous sword which was owned by the king toli was a very famous horse and toral was the saint this women who was supposed to be very beautiful and married to the chieftain so one day what he does he goes and hides in their stable he decides to steal uh, toral and he is a decoyed so you know after the uh, toral comes to distribute prasad and there is one offering which is left in her hand and then you know she calls her husband and they say there is one person who is hiding who is this then jessel comes out and he says i have made a vow that i am going to take toral and her husband very happily hands her over and then there is you know according to legend they both go you know on their way to kutch they cross the sea and there is a heavy storm and you know this decoit is so scared for his life he starts crying and but she is very cool and calm and then she tells him okay tell me about your life and he starts narrating you know what all he has done how many women he has killed how many people he has looted where all he went and did decoity and as he narrates you know the storm subsides and the whole purpose of these stories is that jessel had come into his life to reform him another very important women from 1298 to 1350 is jana bai you know she is a servant maid servant in the house of uh, Nam, namdev and uh, you know in Odi- in uh, maharashtra they wrote the poems which are known as abhang she also writes some of the poems and what is interesting you know she is a servant girl she has always served others you know she is cooking cleaning washing for everyone but there is nobody to take care of her so she imagines krishna god you know who takes care of her her whole poems are so interesting you know it gives us a totally new perspective from a working class uh, angle there is another very important saint called bahina bai in uh, maharashtra she is 17th century she is the only women who has her autobiography and um, you know she is also born in a very poor brahmin family when she is 3 years old she is married to a man who is 30 years old you can very well imagine for him it is a second marriage he is also a brahmin ratnakar pathak and her autobiography you know it is easily available i would request you all to please read it it is such a touching account it was translated into english by john major in 1929 
and she says you know she talks about how difficult her life is she talks about how her husband would beat her how she suffered a lot so you know what we see in the lives of all these women if you read their poems you know we get a lot of information that their life is so difficult after marriage you know they had a fantastic life when they were before marriage they they belonged to either poor families rich families but they were pampered but the moment they are married you know they uh, and when they you know they say that they love god or they are they want to worship god it is really difficult i'll just read out you know mahadevi akka from karnataka you know she says i have maya for mother in law the world uh, for father in law and three brother in law like tigers this husband thoughts are full of laughing women no god this man see according to hindu belief husband is a god but she says imagine she is writing in 12th century and she says no god this man his thoughts are full of laughing women and i cannot cross this sister in law but i will give this wench a slip and go cuckold my husband with hara my lord she says my husband is uh, my um, god malikarjun she calls him she says i don't need this husband and the sister in law is you know trying to guard her she says but i will give this venture slip and i will run away and she talks about there is a constant conflict in them husband inside lover outside i can't manage them both this world and the other world i can't manage them both oh lord white as jasmine i cannot hold in one hand both the round net and the long bow and then you know she says i love this handsome one he has no death decay or form no place or site no end or birthmark i love him oh mother listen so uh, the lord white as jasmine is my husband take these husbands who decay and die and throw them into your kitchen fires imagine she is writing this in 12th century she says i don't i don't need these mortal husbands they are going to decay and die i am married to one who's not going to die she says throw away all these other husbands into the kitchen fire and imagine in 12th century she is writing in such a revolutionary way laldeed you know she is supposed to be so beautiful spinning you know her spinning was so beautiful that it was like a lotus stalk and but you know her mother in law teased her there are stories that you know she, she her mother in law will ask her to go and get water in a pot and she would make a hole by the time she would reach you know all the water will pour out and again she has to go back the whole day she is just made to run up and down to collect water she says they may kill a big sheep or a tender lamb lala will have her lump of stone all right whatever she does she has to bear the brunt and then meera says friends marriage of these work marriage of this world are false and um, you know uh, one minute huh? uh, one second and uh, take um, she says you know she talks about marriage and she says they are uh, they are wiped out of existence wed my indestructible one the serpent death cannot devour she says why should i marry this mortal man who will die these marriages will go out of existence but if i marry my god i will remain um, forever married and then she says you know i constantly rise up go to the temple and dance snapping my fingers i don't follow the norm as the oldest daughter in law i have thrown away the veil you know all these songs are very popular today pad ghungru bandh mera na chire log kahe kul na sire saas kahe kul na sire so you know people she belongs to a royal family she says everybody is saying that you know she has brought shame to the family she does not behave like a royal woman because she goes and dances with all these common people and then she says you know there is so much of a conflict between her bhakti and her society oh friend i cannot live without this delight giver mother in law fights my sister in law teases the rana remains angry they have a watchman sitting at my door and a lock fastened on it why should i give up my first love my only love mera god is the lifter of mountains and nothing else pleases me she says you know her husband is also angry with her every day they have put her in prison there is a lock you know there are so many stories they try to kill her and she says you know they um, they send her a garland of uh, snakes 
but when she puts it in her neck it becomes a pearl necklace they send her chaname to drink with poison but when she drinks it it becomes like amrit you know there are beautiful songs which they have uh, written and bahina bai writes you know her autobiography starts by saying i am now 11 years age but i have not had a moment of joy i had no independence and my wishes have no effect i am very depressed in spirits my daily life is full of troubles and she recognizes you know being a woman there are so many problems which they have to face she says the vedas cry aloud the purana shout no good comes to a woman i was born with a woman's body how am i to attain the truth these are foolish seductive and deceptive any connection with women is disastrous bahina says if a woman's body is so harmful how in the world will i reach the truth she says everybody tells me that you know you are a woman you cannot reach the truth but then i am born with a woman's body what can i do and then you know she says meera says if the sushodhya is angry what can he do let him go and stay in his own country i will go singing the bhajans of my god she says i will wither away i will die if my god is angry with me i don't care if the rana or the king is angry and if he is angry let him go and stay in his palace what is very important to you, you know when you want to accuse a woman the first thing you do even till today in the 21st century you know you talk about her uh, notions of her uh, um uh, body you know how she behaves you know decency and modesty is something which is uh, very important because these are lichpins of a patriarchal you know, society and uh, uh, in, you know uh, today also if you see what happened in the me too movement when sexual harassment cases were filed you know people kept saying why did these women wait for so long and uh, then there was lot of question on their character how they were how they behave so you know this is something which is there right from beginning even in 11th 12th century when you know these women want to reach god if they cast off all notions of decency and modesty what else is there akka mahadevi says she says brother she calls all men as brothers she says brother you have come drawn by the beauty of these bellowing breast this brimming youth i am no women brother nor a woman so you know she says all men except my god are brothers to me and then you know jahana bai says i should not be sad because i am a woman there are many saints who suffer this way and she says unless i sell myself in the marketplace only then can i reach uh, uh, god and uh, uh, you know there is so much of restlessness about which these women talk friends the dark ones eyes i am stuck i grow restless pain spreads through my body my mind is intoxicated i have found few friends all of them are mad the chakor loves the moon the lamp is burnt you know chakor is a bird which is said to um, uh, according to literature you know the chakor falls in love with the uh, moon and it keeps calling the moon throughout the night the moth all of us seen you know the moth loves the fire and it jumps into the fire and dies it she says the fish dies without water dear indeed is such love how can i live without seeing him my heart is not at uh, rest so what is very important you know all these women they rise above their body see it is very interesting you know i unfortunately in one hour time i cannot really uh, give you all the details the men say that an impediment to reach god is the women and many of these men imagine themselves as women when they are worshiping god they imagine god as a male and themselves as female and they talk a lot about women but on the other hand the women see if for an impediment for a man is a woman then it should be the other way around no for the women the impediment should be the uh, man but these women do not even mention men in their writing and they talk about you know they are more disturbed by what society expects out of them akka mahadevi writes you can confiscate money in hand can you confiscate the body's glory to this shameless girl where is the need of cover and dress she herself calls herself you know they openly call themselves slut um, you know a prostitute 
a shameless girl once they accept that you know what else can disturb them nothing can and she rises above the worldly status you know imagine this she's writing in 12th century oh shiva when shall i crush you on my pitcher breast lord white as jasmine when do i join you stripped of my body shape and my heart's modesty and jana bai openly calls herself a slut she says cast off all shame and sell yourself in the market place then alone can you hope to reach lord symbols in hand a veena on my shoulder i go about who dares to stop me the pallo of my sari falls away yet i will enter the crowded market place without a thought jani says my lord i have become a slut see so openly they being away with modesty as if they see breast and long hair coming they call it a women if they see beards and whiskers they call it a man but look at the spirit that hovers in between is neither man nor women and again you know at another place akka mahadevi says suppose you cut a tall bamboo into two make the bottom piece a women and the head piece a man rub them together till they kindle now tell me the fire that is kindled is it a man or women so what is very important is all these women you know though they are negotiating patriarchy in their own terms see this is a period from 12th century to 17th century nothing like women's liberation is happening you know they are not going around with a flag and saying liberation and all they are just saying we want to live life according to our own terms this is what we need and they are kind of you know uh, this is what they are uh, talking unfortunately such an important moment does not occupy an important place in history because we do not have sources to study them you know historical method uses a particular kind of sources none of these women just like in the northeast many of these societies did not have the written word so how does that mean they did not have a history these women also had a history today also their songs are very popular they are very much a part of the local uh, agenda the bhakti you know saints though they were talking of an equal society they were against idolatry they were talking about the tyranny of caste temples rituals but they did not uh, you know include women in their agenda and you had the women who came up and they led very non conformist life either they walked out naked they were singing songs in their own words they moved from one place to another there is a very interesting story you know meera goes to vrindavan she travels all the way to vrindavan and she goes to the ashram of jeev goswami and she says i want to meet him jeev goswami is a big bhakt of krishna and meera is also a devotee of krishna then jeev goswami sends a word saying i have taken a vow that i am not going to see the face of a woman and meera immediately writes a poem and sends inside she says i am surprised to see another man in vrindavan because i thought there was only one man in vrindavan and that is krishna and jeev goswami comes out running and falls at her Uh, feet so you know uh, uh, these are my three books um, which you all can read if you want to understand this moment in detail one is the religious moments in medieval india it was published in 2005 by gyan then you have divine sounds from the heart in 2010 and they have brought out a paper book edition in 2020 so you know this will give you an idea about these uh, moment so you know it's a very interesting moment which unfortunately is not part of history and i would really you know uh, be very happy if you uh, read uh, you know about this because now you know increasingly whenever i set up paper i always include questions related to it thank you very much hello yeah very 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 insightful lecture i would say yeah uh we have to remember that this is the uh, only first part of the lecture and <laughs> again we'll be having another lecture on sufism if time permit and if ma'am allows it and I told you i'm coming to bizoram to give that lecture yeah you have to do that <laughs> okay um 
Bhakti, as far as we can learn from her lecture, is that uh, it was a movement which affected the length and breadth of the Indian subcontinent right from the time of the ancient period to medieval period. And it's uh, what is interesting uh, is that uh, the ideas and the action from the Bhaktas uh, who are riding against the tide of the social norms during that time. I think it was quite interesting. Um, I hope that we will find a suitable time with the professor again, uh, with ma'am again. I, why can't we have some question answers if there are doubts? Yeah, yeah, I'll open. The point in just having a lecture, no, if they want to read. We'll do that. We'll do that. Fine. Uh, simple with uh, clarity is what I can comment for her lecture. And now I will give a time to uh, even to the students and also the faculty who are present out here. I saw some uh, names like Dr. Haris, Padmaja, uh, Dr. Samuel, Atsuana, Professor Kisor, and Azwali also. If they can enlighten us or make the comments, or if you can ask a question, uh, the time is given to you. Can I, uh, ma'am? Please. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, you know, I, I remembered my MA lecture, I should say, uh, you know, <laughs> when you thought about the Bhakti movement, I'm gone 22 years back now. So okay. it's very happy listening to you, Ma'am. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Ma'am, uh, do, uh, especially in the Maharashtra Bhakti tradition, uh, did everyone uh, write their uh, biographies, autobiographies, Ma'am, or... Um, like if 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 so, like uh, are they translated, like uh, Namdevs and others, ma'am? No, see, unfortunately, uh, I have really not looked so much in detail about the men. There is only yeah. one autobiography which a woman has written, and that is by Nabais. That That's has been translated okay. into English in 1929 by um, um, John Major. He is the one who okay. has uh, translated it. But yes, uh, you know the the women in Maharashtra are much more conservative than other parts of India. That is also very interesting because yeah. you know, other places, they are so revolutionary, so dynamic, but in Maharashtra, they are still confined to the family. The husband continues to be very important. They even, you know, when they write their poems, they don't write their name. They write so-and-so, the mother of, they give a male name or the sister of so-and-so. So, -and -so. so right, it right. is, but only Bahina Bai's autobiography is available. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, ma'am. I think as you told, they were not as revolutionary as Akamaha Devi or Lal Dates, oh. uh, you know, versus, yeah, yeah. Sure, ma'am. I'll see to that. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else who have a question, even from the, especially from the students? No question. I was surprised. Malsam, I have a lot of YouTube videos also on this. Sir, Pradam. I'll share some links with you. They can, because I have done yeah. some lessons also. Students can even go through those lessons. I would also advise you all to please go to Academic Edu. I'm sure if you look at Academic Edu, you know, you can just go to Google. If you type my name, you will get the link. And in Academic Edu, everything is available freely. You can <laughs> download if there is no copyright issue all my writing most of my writings on bhakti the articles and all are easily available you can download them freely you know you can just follow and download it ma'am i'm audible yeah ma'am apna shawal hindi mein pooch sakta hu aha please bataiye no ma'am mera bahut samanya sa sawal hai ki jo और हमारे सुपरवाइजर प्रोफेसर महेश प्रसाद अहिवार है और पुष्पलता मैम के थ्रू मैंने आपका नाम सुना है पुष्पलता सिंह हमारी पूर्व एच ओडी है अच्छा हमारा प्रश्न ये था की जो जैसे हमेशा से हम देखते हैं की भारत में कई बातें मिलती है तो जो हम भक्ति मूवमेंट में एक सगुण और निरुण परंपरा देखते हैं तो क्या इस परंपरा को हम श्रवण और वैदिक परंपरा की ही कंटिन्यूटी से जोड़ सकते हैं या एक ये एक अलग परंपरा है 
नहीं नहीं देखिए जो भी परंपरा हुई वो अलग से तो नहीं डेवलप हुई ना कंटिन्यूएशन तो रहा ही था उससे नहीं ये जो स्पेशली यू you नो know, एकदम एक नई नहीं थी मैंने ये बात बताई थी कि एंशियंट कॉन्सेप्ट था लेकिन मिडिवल में उससे ही उन्होंने आगे लेकर के उसका स्वरूप थोड़ा बदला है तो ये कंटिन्यूटी रही है पहले से थैंक यू मैम और मैम एक एक दूसरा प्रश्न ये है कि जो सूफी जो सुफिजम आया हिंदुस्तान में तो सुफिजम का जो हॉटलैंड था वो खुरासान था ईरान का क्षेत्र था ना कि अरब के मुल्क थे तो जब सुफिजम भारत में आता है तो क्या सुफिजम में जो चीजें जो मिस्टिसिज्म आती है मेडिटेशन आता है तो क्या उस पर जैसे नॉर्मली शहाबुद्दीन इराकी करके जे के स्कॉलर है उनका मानना है कि सुफिजम से भक्ति मूवमेंट प्रभावित हुआ लेकिन मैं पढ़ता हूं तो मुझे लगता है कि नहीं हमारी ट्रेडिशन ने बहुत ज्यादा सुफिजम को सुफिजम का भारतीयकरण किया तो मैम आपका क्या इस पे स्टेटमेंट होगा कि मैं ना जो अभिषेक मैं दूसरा लेक्चर आई थिंक सुफिजम का ही दूंगी तो उसमें ये डेफिनेटली यू नो ये नहीं बोल क्योंकि ये लोग एक यूनिवर्सल गॉड की बात कर रहे थे यूसुफ हुसैन लिखते हैं कि इस्लाम से प्रभावित ये पुरानी देखिए अब गीता में पुराण में जब हमको भक्ति का कॉन्सेप्ट मिलता है तो हम कैसे कह सकते हैं कि ये सूफिज्म से प्रभावित है या इस्लाम से प्रभावित है तो ये यू नो डेफिनेटली इंडियन ट्रेडिशन का है इंडियन टेक्स में इसकी वो है और सूफिज्म यू नो एक दूसरे से प्रभावित हुए होंगे यू नो क्योंकि जिस तरह से अगर आप कबीर को पढ़िए इसको पढ़िए चिश्ती सिलसिला यहाँ पे बहुत पॉपुलर हुआ है तो दे डिड बोरो फ्रॉम ईच अदर बट ये नहीं बोल सकते हैं कि इसकी वजह से ये हुआ है टीचिंग इन हिंदी सेम माई स्टूडेंट ऑल्सो इन द सेम uh tone so oh, you know yes. and and it is very uh, you know it is very happy i'm very happy to you know teach in a very different you know bilingual language yeah. and i got exposed it for quite long time now here <laughs> zoli can you ask the students no i want the students <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody is asking you a question here ma pe kar lo ando please uh, introduce yourself i'll be very happy C- come on uh, video see as it is sitting behind a screen you know i don't feel like talking much maapleka <laughs> kindly <laughs> introduce yourself hello ma'am maapleka and, and you know uh, come on video yeah please yes ma'am mm. where are you ma'am yeah yeah my question is that can we can we attribute the rise of bhakti movement as you know as against a reaction against the entry of uh, islam islamic philosophy in india see that is how it was interpreted by many scholars you know scholars who are trying to show see if i ha- i did not because it's a one hour lecture i really did not go into the historiography of this movement but you know the orientalists looked at it in a different way the marxists looked at it in a different way you had people who looked at it in as an impact of islam some looked at it in terms of uh, uh, you know that they were trying to bring about uh, uh, reform and change uh, society so historians who are saying like you know because of islam this movement came into being and they adopted a lot of practices from islam because these were the principle but i don't think it is true because like i said you know these concepts existed in indian uh, literature much much before even islam was born what is important is they have taken those concepts and in the changing context it has been converted into a movement from a cult from a concept it has become a movement and for the to make it a movement you know definitely the situation in medieval times where you know there was lot of feudal oppression where there were regional kingdoms where there was exploitation of the people they were not allowed to read sanskrit all these played a very major role in that so the economic situation the political situation the social situation played a major role in shaping this into a movement 
but i would not just say that uh, you know because of islam that it came into me and definitely once the movement go they also try to if you read their writings they try to bridge the difference between the hindus and the muslim you know a very famous poem of kabir he says he says you know that the hindus uh, you know uh, they uh, worship all these stone and they uh, you know he says if you by worshiping a stone if you get you can get god then i will worship a mountain because i will get a bigger god and he says this mulla the you know molvi goes on shouts on top you know of the mosque he says it's like the you know the cock in early morning who crows so they are very critical of both they are trying to bridge a gap between the two but basically they are against ritualism both in islam as well as in uh, hinduism so it is influenced by the uh, development in medieval period but we cannot say that uh, it comes about as a result of islam fine yeah very interesting anyone else so i have a question can i go forward yeah introduce right. yourself uh, good evening ma'am uh, thank you for this lovely lecture it's kritika punia this side i'm not currently enrolled in any university i'm applying uh, i'm applying for phd in various universities uh, it was very interesting the way you uh, brought out how the cultural context is defining what the women are writing about or orally uh, uh, speaking about i was wondering since women status is often defined by their cultural context and tribal societies are said to be uh, comparatively more uh, uh, um, i would say uh, more equal so in that context i don't know how the spread of bhakti movement and how far it was able to impact tribal areas but if we um, take a general picture how did the tribal culture and the sense of comparative equality in them impacted the bhakti movement especially the status of women in the bhakti movement yeah see krita uh, definitely when we talk of uh, tribal society we really do not have so much uh, evidence tantricism did spread because we have enough evidence that you know even in tantricism women have a high status and it spread but bhakti as such you know how much it spread we really don't know because definitely it was limited to these different pockets it would have spread but we like i said you know we do not have historical facts to prove or disprove it again you know this whole many of my students while is here they have worked a lot on the northeastern societies and this whole notion that a tribal society is equal is also something which we need to really question because they have also been influenced by patriarchy so i don't think uh, you know though it appears to be it is definitely much more equal than the mainland uh, society but they also have the uh, differences which is uh, there so in the tribal areas if you look at it it was more uh, uh, you know tantricism which was spreading and it was trying to you know give some importance to women and uh, rather than you know bhakti in those pockets but you know uh, you did if you look at it you know in many of these tribals uh, even uh, when you look at it around 18th 19th century you have a number of tribal gods in my own work on devdasis you know devdasi tradition is one is the mainstream tradition but you have a lot of these regional tradition which come in with these local gods which come in and i'm sure something like that would have happened during this movement also and uh, which would have there but unfortunately this is an area where really not much work has been done fine yeah thank you so much thank you good question with good reply anyone else <coughs> anyone else sir i have a request if these types of lecture organized rapidly kindly add me on your group or uh, kindly add my mail and always give me notification i will try to attend all of your lectures very good we'll do that anyone else my email from the students yes sir that I I have shared my email, sir, in chat box. Okay, no problem. I'll take that down. Thank you, sir. Where are your students? I want to listen to some students. Come on. Yeah, come on. Like Pekka, we have uh, anyone else? Ah, uh, one question, ma'am. Yeah. 
Uh, you introduce, is there... introduce yourself okay. kindly. My, uh, my name is Zon Undara. I am from MZU Students, History and Ethnography Department. And my question is, is there any caste distinction uh, for those people who follow the Bhakti movement? If there is no, uh, uh, what is the reason? See, um, you, you know, uh, this whole movement is trying to, so they are talking, everybody, this is only there in principle. In reality, if you read Baina Bai's autobiography, her husband and she belong to the Brahmin community. She accepts Tukaram as her guru. Tukaram belong to the Shudra community, the lower caste. And her husband is so angry. He says, what nonsense is all this? Tukaram, who's a scheduled caste, how can he be your guru? So, you know, the caste difference, though they were talking of everyone being equal in the eyes of God, um, it really did not, you know, it continued as it was. The very fact that it continues till, you know, 19th century social mm -hmm. reform movement, it is there today. So they were really not able to address this question properly. That is what I uh, think. And definitely, you know, it continued to play a very important uh, role because uh, uh, what they did, if you read Ramanuja, what Ramanuja did, he said that, you know, you can, the, everybody is allowed into the temple, even the lower caste, but only once a year on Ram Naomi day. So, you know, that cannot bring in equality when you are allowed to enter the temple only once a day. So, you know, they tried to bridge in the gap. Imagine a society which was so divided, it had so many rules of pollution and purity. Akka Mahadevi and all in the Veer Shaiva movement, you know, they did away with the whole concept of pollution. According to Hindu philosophy, a woman becomes impure when she has a menstruation. She cannot go and worship God, etc. And when there is a death in the family, the whole family is polluted. But they did away with these concepts <coughs> of inspiration or not. You could worship God. You could. So they were really talking in terms of equality. Even if there is a death, there is no question of you know, pollution with that family. And they said, you don't need a temple. You can carry God with you. They carried the linga in their chain. Wherever you are going, you can just take out and worship it over there. So it was a very revolutionary idea at that time. And most of the people of the Veer Shaivas came from the lower caste and communities. But there is a very interesting article written by Nandi, uh, Dr. Nandi, where he shows towards the end, you know, they also became equally divided into caste. The lower caste, you know, especially they were treated very badly. You had five divisions which emerged. It's a very, you know, important article. I can uh, send you the details once. I think 1974 or something it was published. And though the whole Veer Shaiva movement started by talking about equality, everybody being equal. In the end, it was as divided as, um, um, you know, like any other community. So, though, yes, that was the ideal, that was the principle. It never really happened in reality. Fine. Very good. Anyone else? Ma'am, I have one question. Can yeah, you hear me? Uh, my name is Lennon. My name is Lanan Sara, and I am currently pursuing my master's degree in government as always college. Okay. And my question might be a little bit off topic. I'm not sure, but no, I know that you... is welcome. <laughs> Don't worry, yeah. nothing is off topic. Hmm. Yeah. I know that you are specialized in the field of gender studies, and you even mentioned a role played by both male and female back in the days um, during and after the Bhakti movement arose. And I want to know, I am curious, uh, is there any role that was mentioned which was played by which we call today the third gender people or the gay or lesbian people? Because we barely hear much of a thing about them, the role they played. Many historians or book writers never mention much of a thing about them. So I'm a little bit curious and I want to know your perspective about them and the way, uh, how you perceive them. And, and I want to know the role they played back in the days. See, uh, 
see if, it's very it's difficult you know when we talk of history we need um, you know data we need historical truth and definitely in this whole moment there is no information let me tell you we really did not get but if you look at the other texts the transgender you know they are supposed to be they have that power given from god in the you know they are looked down upon more in the modern and contemporary period in these times medieval time if you look at the um, you know sultans and all they appointed a number of eunuchs especially you know they had very strict rules of parda mm -hmm. women were not allowed into the open so you had transgender people or others who were appointed as bodyguards they were the ones who were guarding the women mm. and they were treated as you know they uh, <clears throat> lot of you know they uh, directly coming from god it was in you know like uh, when you come more you move towards the modern period there is a lot of poverty they are shunned you know especially when the period where you have a lot of these victorian morality which comes into our society then you know you have a certain notions of you know um sex should be within marriage it should be you know confined in the domestic sphere so then you have all these notions which come up and they, they are really looked down upon and many countries legislate uh, but in medieval period i don't think we have any such evidence that they were looked down upon or they were because among the islamic societies very openly they accept if you read babar's autobiography you know he talks at one place he says he is so much attracted by a young man who's who looks very handsome to him and all i don't think we have those kinds of evidence in other places so you know as far as the bhakti movement is concerned i really do not have any material but in general i can tell you that in that society at least among the islamic society it was accepted yes thank you ma'am ma'am i have another question which is yeah. uh, pertaining to my first question do you believe in third gender can there be a third gender i want to know your personal opinion about that yes definitely why not i you know uh, some uh, somebody interviewed me last month and they said you know the we had a, um, our university was the first university in the country where they had a um, uh, you know committee to look into gender these uh, you know issues and i was chairing that session i didn't know it till that time that you know uh, this was the first in the country and this person was uh, you know he was doing a project from the us and he says in india this was the first committee which was there so yes you know we did have a committee we were looking into these issues but it's not that easy you know accepting it see because uh, we did not you know i'll tell you my experiences and my problem when these boys say that we you know they feel that they are women and they want to use the common toilets the girls are very uncomfortable how do we allow that they don't feel comfortable in a boys toilet so you know we need gender neutral toilets but we need finances to create those there are lots of issues which came up but i think today there is a much more acceptance to these issues we dealt with so many cases where we had to talk to the parents we had to talk to the family you know two three years the parents kept they they found it very difficult to accept and all that but yes you know it's a reality and to me personally you are asking my personal opinion a person who belongs to the, they are they are not harmful to society to me a rapist a person who does violence he would be more harmful to society than a person whose sexual orientation is different i would welcome those people they are you know it's always nice how does it matter you know what is their sexual orientation that is something for them to deal with privately i don't judge that based on that you know? so how does it matter they do not create any harm to our society so we should really welcome rules and regulations you know there was so much of a bias which is there fine thank you ma'am uh, any mm. other hello ma'am yeah uh, hello uh, yeah please. i'm lel pian pui from a students of mizoram university from department of history and ethnography and i how 
how this sources or autobiography or biographies are relevant how they became relevant to study till today like um, like the saints like uh, the stories of women uh, you told us were dated back to 14th century or 15th century how they became relevant is it documented or orally passed down Oh, no, I couldn't get the first half of your question because the voice was breaking. But from what I understand, you are asking me, you know, how did we get information? One, they are very much part of a popular culture. In every Hindu home, you know, today also their songs are sung. Their bhajans are very popular. And uh, so, you know, we have to, there may have been a lot of interpolations over the period because they were writing in 12th century to 15th century, there would have been a lot of changes and all, but we do get a sense of what they were writing. So, you know, it is not something which is, in 18th century, there was an attempt to sit down and write. Most of this literature is written down towards the end of 18th century. We have books which talk about it. But otherwise, you know, it was an oral tradition which came up till 18th century. Fine. So, you know, when you, when you work on a movement like the Bhakti movement, we <clears throat> cannot go by the traditional historical methodology. You cannot adopt the sources because where are the archives? Where will you get information on them? We have to really, you know, I used a lot of feminist methods. I used a lot of anthropological methods, ethnographical methods, and historical methods. And then I could recreate the history. Many historians will say this is not history. But then how do we write about a movement? I mean, this is true for the Northeast also, where you do not have written records, where you do not have a language, where you do not have an archives. How do you create a history of that period? So, you know, we have to really move. I mean, I, as a historian, I think I move beyond the traditional uh, boundaries of how a historian, you know, studies uh, uh, the sources. We have to look for different kinds of sources. Miss. Anything else? Mm. Yes, Miss. I have another question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bhakti movement basically became a space for the female Bhaktis to counter the Brahmanical patriarchy, right? Yeah. So uh, my question is uh, that what was the reaction of the male Bhaktas yes. uh, against those feminists from the framework of uh, Hindu theology? How, how did they react? See, one, um, I wouldn't only say Brahmanical patriarchy because patriarchy is patriarchy. Whether it is Brahminical, whether it is Kshatriya, whether it is Vaishya, or whether it is even Shudra. You know, I don't think we can put it into caste and say this patriarchy was patriarchy. As historians, all of us know our society has undergone so many modes of production. If you look at it, you know, we started with primitive mode of production, slave mode of production, feudal mode of production, capitalist mode of production, socialist mode of production. But patriarchy is something which continues throughout. In fact, women also support patriarchy in a uh, different way. Yes. So, you know, what is very interesting is, you know, if you look at, compare it to Europe, you have a large number of women in the same period, because I have, all my students know, I have taught European history, you know, medieval societies, I think I have taught for donkey's years now, more than 20, 25 years, you know, that course. So, you did have a lot of women in medieval societies also, but they were treated as witches. They were burnt on stakes, Joan of Arc, etc. If a woman was little dynamic, she was different, she was not like the traditional women, you know, they were seen as witches, they were burnt. Here were women who were walking out of Mm, their homes, they were walking out naked, they were roaming around. Imagine 12th, 13th century, they had to fear not only animals walking in jungles, they were men who were roaming around. But these women walked around, they moved to different places. And yet, we do not hear of any of these women being burnt or looked mm -hmm. down upon. In fact, they were treated as gods. Today also in any regional textbook, there will be a poem written by these women, which is very much a part of the syllabus of ninth class or 10th class exam. So that is the beauty of Indian culture. You know, even when these, there are few women, they, they are not thousands and thousands of these women. Even these handful of women who broke rules, none of them remained in marriage. You know, there were certain ideals according to Hinduism, 
only a, you know a man has to worship god his ancestors his guru but for a woman her god is her husband she only has to worship her husband you know she has to be a pati vrata sati vrata these were women who were totally in contrast to this none of them consummated their marriage they walked out of <coughs> they walked out naked none of them had children and yet we continue to worship them they were really not looked down upon so it is very interesting you know that we treated them as saints they were not unlike the western society we never killed them or burned them and they were seen as being very different women who had a lot of impact on society it's getting interesting anything else <laughs> anything else especially from the students you see uh, i agree with ma'am uh, opinion in terms of methodology let me say uh, we have to move beyond this traditional methodology and the same thing i had a problem with when i did my phd you remember when they used to question us how can you use this oral history as your sources is it possible and then finally uh, like ma'am came to our rescue she said that we have to move beyond this traditional Euro eurocentric point of view and then finally we could finish our phd uh, uh, if we don't do that i think it's very problematic as far as this methodology is concerned and uh anyone else if you have any question i will give time again and if not we uh i saw zoli but uh, she said that she had a problem with her microphone so and she could not speak Hello. Well. Hello. oh finally yeah. then okay. if you can speak <laughs> yeah very glad now audible yeah yeah yes okay thank you so much ma'am for your very insightful lecture yeah um i have no question because uh, <laughs> i was in her class uh, back in 2001 she taught this paper and i was uh, i just want to share uh, um, uh, with my students, they, uh, more than half of them are my students in Amazon University. I was working with uh, Rekapandir Mam for like for more than eight years. I was doing MPhil and a PhD and under her guidance. And then before that, I was uh, I was um, uh, I was opting her paper, uh, Region Society uh, in Medieval India. Uh, which I'm presently teaching in, in the U, and I'm also like <laughs> following her footsteps. I have been teaching medieval societies uh, since 2012, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Uh, 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 regarding the Bhakti movement, I just want to give a few comments. Uh, yeah, uh, before I came to Hyderabad, I was never aware of female bhaktas. So uh, yeah, we uh, we did uh, we studied uh, Bhakti movement and during our uh, during under graduation. But uh, female bhaktas were not, were never, they, they are never included in our syllabus. So I still remember when I, uh, uh, when I inter when I face interview for part time lecture in Mizoram State Government. So one of my ex one of our experts asked me uh, if I knew any like uh, reformer or like uh, any bhaktas during the uh, in, in the bhakti movement. So I mentioned female bhaktas like uh, Mirabai, Akama, Hadevi, Laldet, and so on. So the expert himself wasn't aware of it. <laughs> so I just want to uh, thank ma'am for uh, um, uh, teaching me all those uh, uh, female bhaktas during our MA days. And then so it was it was her paper, like it was uh, this paper. I haven't, uh, I think I haven't shared with her uh, even during my PhD days. So it was, uh, it was the bhakti move. It was through the bhakti movement that uh, I started to have interest uh, uh, in uh, doing like uh, women's history, uh, particularly during the uh, uh, pre-colonial times in which I focus on the uh, earlier uh, women, 
son composers okay, who, uh, who use uh, songs as a site of resistance, uh, resistance against patriarchy. So I, uh, I haven't told ma'am, I think I was one of the first uh, scholars who focus on, uh, we, uh, on how women, uh, Mizo women use a song as a site of resistance uh, during the pre-colonial times. So uh, I would like to thank uh, ma'am once again for always being uh, an ardent supporter uh, for uh, her students, not only her, uh, her scholars, uh, all of her uh, students in Hyderabad, uh, her ex-students, her old students in Hyderabad, everyone uh, is, every, every, all, every student is always being very close to her. So thank you, ma'am, once again. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Hmm. Fine. That's all. No more questions. Balsam. I think that uh, the... oh, Harish is also here, no? Yeah, Zubali. <laughs> <laughs> We are all MAMS, old students, yes. MA students, PhD students. Yeah, it's more than two decades now. <laughs> Ma'am, it has been 22 years since yes. we heard about yes. the Bhakti movement in the class. <laughs> I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, about 14, 15 of my students are teaching in different universities. In India. So, yes. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Where is very small sum, yeah. Yeah. Fine, I think where's yeah, yes. Uh, uh, yes, he's coming back now. Yes, I'm coming back. Yeah, I yeah. thought I already switched on my uh, video and sound again. No, mistakenly, I switched it off. Anyhow, um, mm -hmm. now I will call upon Miss Angela, a faculty from Government High School West College, to propose a vote of thanks. Fine, only I just want to say one thing that please, I will share some videos with the, you know if you go to youtube put my name you will get some videos but i will share the links where you can uh, you know listen to the, about this moment and second go to academic edu you will find lots of papers you know because see once we speak it's difficult all of you will be writing an exam some of you you know you need material to write this so i would uh, request you to uh, you know go to academic edu and you can download many of those pages which are there where I talk about the Bhakti movement. And if possible for your library, you get the books also on the three books which I'm uh, suggesting. Fine. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. You're audible. Good evening to the honorable chief guests, professors, and my dear students. On behalf of the Department of History, Government is always college. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests, Professor Rekha Pandey, Director of SEED and Professor of History in Hyderabad University for the special lecture on Bhakti movement in India. It was truly insightful. Thank you. Sincere thanks to Prof the Department of History and Ethnography, Mizoram University, and our partner, MS Academy, and Professor Sila Tlingliana, Principal GAWC, as well as Dr. Samuel V. L. Hanga, HOD, Department of History, Government Azo West College, and all the faculties involved for making this special lecture possible. Finally, I would like to thank all of you present here for making the time to be with us today and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you one and all. Okay, fine. See you all then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Nice getting Good night. in touch.